Welcome to this introduction to Rotational Vibrational Spectroscopy, of HCL. The aim of this experiment is to determine the spectroscopic parameters for HCL and relate these to structural information about the molecule. This video aims to provide some theoretical information underpinning the experiment, along with some guidance on how to complete data analysis and some points to consider in reviewing the results obtained. First up, we will consider light absorption by the HCL diatomic molecule. Depending on the wavelength or energy of light, transitions of different magnitudes will occur. For example, with UV visible light, an electronic transition from the ground electronic state to the excited electro electronic state will occur. This is studied by UV visible spectroscopy. For infrared radiation, transitions between vibrational levels within one electronic state will occur. These are studied by infrared spectroscopy. We will quickly recap vibrational and rot rotational transitions. The picture shows the vibrational levels n is equal to 0, n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, and so on, within the ground electronic state. Also shown are rotational levels, whose energy differences are much smaller again. Each vibrational level has its own subset of rotational levels. Therefore, on absorption of infrared light, an electron can be promoted from one vibrational level to another, and for each of these vibrational transitions, there are several possible rotational transitions that can occur. These are called Rho-Vib transitions, rotational vibra vibrational transitions. We will look at these again shortly. The model here in this video shows a vibrating HCl molecule. Note that the chlorine or chloride is almost, but not absolutely, stationary. As infrared light is irradiated on the molecule, this energy absorbed causes vibration. We can find out exactly what energy is required by running an infrared spectrum. The model spectrum here shows us that the energy absorbed by HCl to cause this vibration is 2929 wave numbers. The actual HCl spectrum is not a single line, but a series of almost symmetrical centered almost symmetrical lines centered on that energy we just mentioned, 2929 wave numbers. Note that 2929 doesn't itself appear, and we'll say why later. There are a range of possible vibrational transitions from the lower vibrational level to the upper vibrational level. There are two scenarios. Those higher energy transitions to the right of the central 2929 point are transitions from one vibrational level to the next with an increase in the rotational level. For example, the J prime prime equals zero in the lower level going to J prime equals one in the upper level, or one in the lower level going to two in the upper level, and so on. As we move through to the transitions, note that there is always a difference of one between the lower rotational level and the upper one. This is because of a selection rule which governs these transitions. You should now be able to explain why we don't see the central peak at 2929 wave numbers. And you should also be able to suggest why the overall spectrum is not exactly symmetrical because of the selection rule. So the peaks to the right of the central point arise from an increase of 1 from the rotational levels in the ground vibrational level and the upper level. You can now see that the peaks to the left lower energy level arise from a decrease in the value of J by 1. It is this which gives rise to our observed experimental rotational vibrational spectrum of HCL. So, again, here is our overall spectrum with the transitions marked. Spectroscopists normally use a double prime notation to indicate an energy level in the ground level, and a single prime notation to indicate an energy level in the upper level. As an example here, I have highlighted the J prime prime equals 5 to J prime equals 4 transition. This expression tells me that an electron was promoted from the ground vibrational level, rotational level number 5, to the first vibrational level, rotational level number 4. So this is a summary of what we have said about uh, light absorption by HCl. The infrared light source results in vibrational transitions within the ground electronic state. Because the difference between the rotational energy levels within a vibrational le energy level are very much less than kT, Several possible rotational levels, rotational transitions are possible. This is essentially the Boltzmann distribution. And resulting rotational vibrational data reveals a lot of information about the energy levels in the molecule. 
Moving on to the next section, we'll look at how to quantify the concepts we have just discussed. We've seen already how infrared absorption looks in terms of the vibrating molecule, but we need a way to model this mathematically. The simplest way to do this is to start off with the vibrational energy of a simple harmonic oscillator, all the way back to first year physics. This tells us that the energy of a vibration transition depends on the oscillating frequency increasing with the energy of the vibrational level in question, so for v is equal to 0, 1, 2 and so on. The expression for the oscillating frequency, in case you've forgotten, is shown on the right hand side of the screen. However, remember we mentioned that the CL is not completion, completely stationary, so we need to adjust this expression as shown in the second boxed equation. This essentially corrects the simple harmonic oscillator model for the distortions, in other words the moving chloride atom, that occur in the real world. We'll explain all the terms in a while. One thing to be wary of is units. So I've highlighted here the units of energy that arise from these expressions, wave numbers. What does the difference between the harmonic and anharmonic look like in terms of energy levels? The red line here represents the potential energy diagram of the anharmonic system. The important point here is that at, as energy levels get higher, they get closer until they merge. Therefore, there is a maximum number of energy levels in any system, and we'll look at this later in data analysis. In the same way that we consider the energy of the vibrational transition, we can also consider the much smaller rotational transition, that component of the total energy transition involved in the change of J of plus or minus 1. Remember that selection rule. The energy depends on the rotational constant, B bar, and it is shown here. Therefore, we can sum together the rotational and vibrational transition to give the total energy of each transition. So we're in a strong position now. We have conceptually described the transitions involved when HCl absorbs light, represented by the red arrows. We have now also quantified the total energy involved in each of these transitions. This means we can now analyze our real spectrum obtained in the lab and extract some physical information about HCl from this data. We can now move on to the data analysis as applicable to this experiment. OK, so here's a slide we showed before showing the total energies involved in each trans transition for any given vibrational en energy level V and rotational level J. The transitions observed in the spectrum are grouped into those which fall into the lower, cat lower energy than the central point, called the P-band, those which fall above the central point, called the OR-band, and the central point itself, called the Q-band. We don't see the Q-band as it's a forbidden transition. It involves the J equals zero transition. We can derive from the energy expression for each transition by subtracting the difference between the P and OR transitions for the same rotational energy level J prime prime. We'll see that this difference will be equal to an amount which includes the rotational constant B1 bar because we're looking at the first uh, differences in the first um, vibrational level. We can calculate B1 bar by plotting a range of the differences against uh, 2j prime prime plus 1, which would be a straight line whose slope is 2b1 bar. Similarly, we can compute b0 bar from the straight similar straight line plot by examining the differences in energy between the corresponding j prime prime minus 1, p and or bands. From both these plots, we can compute the b0 and b1 rotational constants. To do this, we need to make a table that would enable us to gather the data to draw both of these plots. This will be our main data gathering phase in the experiment, to read off the values of the spectrum you produce for your sample and calculate the differences in energy between the corresponding transitions. The next step is to use these rotational constants to get some physical data. First up is the radius of the HCl bond in the ground and first vibrationally excited state. Knowing B0 bar and B1 bar, we can use the equation from earlier and calculate it in joules. Mu in this expression is the reduced mass of HCl. The equilibrium radius can then be calculated. Knowing B0 bar and B1 bar, we can solve for BE, the equilibrium rotational constant, using simultaneous equations, with V is equal to 0 and 1 respectively. Once we know QE, the, ro the equilibrium rotational constant, we can calculate the equilibrium radius in the same way as before. 
The next stage is to work out the equilibrium frequency. In a manner similar to before, subtracting the total energies of the lower, the first vibrational level, and the lower, the second vibrational level, we are left with a simple expression for delta E, which is two unknowns, the oscillation frequency and the unharmonicity constant, Xe. The problem here is that we only have data which involves the lower to first vibrational level. We don't have the lower to second vibrational level. The lower to first vibrational level energy is called the fundamental absorption. If we look closely at our experimental spectrum, which you should have when you finish the experiment, at approximately double the value of the fundamental absorption, we should see a much weaker series of absorptions corresponding to the zero of the two vibrational bands. This is called the first overtone. Finding the center point here allows us to juice, to juice a value for delta E for the two transitions, and hence again we can use simultaneous equations. Now we know these fundamental parameters, we can calculate a lot more information about HCL, for example, the zero point energy. Using this equation, we just substitute V is equal to zero into our expression. We can calculate the number of vibrational levels. Remember before we said they're a finite number. Knowing the anharmonicity constant, uh, we can calculate the, num the maximum number of vibrational levels. You should be able to see from this expression how that this number depends on the magnitude of the anharmonicity constant. And we can also calculate the dissoci dissociation energy of HCl. Finally, we can calculate the force constant. And again, this expression involves the reduced mass mu. All of this information can be computed from just knowing and applying the fundamental principles to the rotation vibration spectra. One final thing to consider is that the actual spectrum of HCL you obtain will be one level more complicated. As there are two isotopes of chlorine, there will be two coincident peaks at each transition, one for each isotope, and this is going to affect the reduced mass calculations. We can consider these in the discussion. So in your discussion, you should tabulate all values determined for H35Cl and H37Cl and compare these with the liturgy values. Liturgy values should be available for H35Cl. You can comment on the effect of the isotope on bond length. What would you predict if the H35Cl was compared with D35Cl? And you can compare the bond lengths OR0, OR1 and OR-E and explain any differences observed.